Welcome to Waiatea Fifth Estate, brought to you by Voyager Internet, independently tested by TrueNet as New Zealand's fastest ISP for home and business fibre internet connections. Call them on 0800 4 speed for $69 unlimited internet per month. Māori have lost a great rangatira this week in Dr Ngāpō Wehi, the kapahaka expert will be sadly missed. The whānau at Wātea 5th Estate sent aroha ki te whānau wehi. Nō reira e koro, haere, haere atu rā. Kia ora and welcome to Wātea 5th Estate, brought to you by Voyager. This is a multi-platform current affairs programme streaming live on wāteanews.com, thedailyblog.co.nz and broadcasting live on Face TV Sky Channel 83. Viewers, you can ask our guests questions or take our poll. Just go to Wātea News and The Daily Blog. Well, in our ongoing critique of child youth and family and its devolution into a new agency by April next year, where we have a working title for the new ministry, and it's Ministry for Vulnerable Children. Children's Commissioner Andrew Beecroft has labelled the name stigmatising and cripplingly disappointing. Given Māori children make up the majority of kids in care, is this name a tohu of what's to come? With us this evening in studio, child advocate and former CEO Tamana Ririki and Tom Blanc. Kia ora, Kia ora. On phone, social services manager for Te Runanga o Ngāpuhi, Liz Marsden. Kia ora, Liz. Uh, kia ora. Also on phone is uh, child advocate, social worker, lecturer, social work lecturer from Massey University and PhD uh, doctorate student, Paura Crawford Moyle. Tēnā koe, Kia ora, everyone. And on Skype, we have President of the Māori Women's Welfare League, Pru Kapua. Tēnā koe, Pru. Kia ora, kia ora, Kledet. Well, um, Anton, let me go to you first, because you're all about um, PR, you know about PR. Mm. PR disaster, what do you think? A terrible name, labelling kids vulnerable from the go-get. It's um, not a good look, Anton. Um, I don't have, I, uh, in terms of the name, I'm, I'm, I'd have to say that I don't have a strong um, reaction to the name. I think that, um, and unlike other people in the sector, I don't have issues um, talking about vulnerable children because I think New Zealand children are vulnerable. We have um, really high rates of child poverty. So a third of New Zealand children living in um, child poverty. We've got really high uh, maltreatment rates compared to other developed countries and one of the highest death by maltreatment rates in the developed world. So in terms of talking about vulnerable children in New Zealand, I don't have problems talking about that. As a brand, I'm not so sure. Well, I, I think you're raising a really interesting point here, Liz. Um, Anton has said he has no problem with that name, Vulnerable Children. I suppose there's a couple of things here. One is that we're so sensitised to um, negative kupu, like vulnerable. Or the second thing is we have to call it what it is. So w what's your whakaro on the on the name and it is a working title so far, Ministry for Vulnerable Children. What's your whakaro on that? Um, you're talking to me, to Liz? Yeah, Liz. Yeah. Okay, you, Liz. sorry, there's a bit of a whistle going on. Um, I, don't, I don't particularly like the name. I don't like having, I don't think it's necessary to have vulnerable in the title because I, I agree with Judge Beecroft that it does or it could tend to stigmatise those who need the services of this new agency. Um, that's a personal thing. I, I don't like the, the word vulnerable in, in, in being part of the title. I think there's other more neutral um, titles that could be given to the new organisation. Well, I think, and Prue, what we're hearing is that if we just want to get on with the mahi, regardless of what it's called, whether it's, you know, whether it's called Ministry for Vulnerable Children or whether it's called something else altogether. I know the Māori Party want to call it Ministry for Fano. But um, whatever it is, I think we're just all focused on the mahi. Is that, is that how you would see it? Yeah, that's true, yeah. And you, Pro? 
Uh, I, I agree, although I do have some concern about um, the vulnerable and the children and forgetting about the whanau. You know, I, th I think we have to look at, at a, a name that's going to be a little bit more aspirational um, than vulnerable children and, uh, and something that incorporates, because we do tend to put the children at the front and centre and, and that's as it be. Uh, but we actually forget sometimes, and perhaps MS forget sometimes, that there's a whānau that's related to that, and uh, it would be good to see that reflected in the name. Well, I think uh, Prue raises a really interesting point, Kaura, about uh, Tamariki being the front and centre of the service delivery, and particularly for this new ministry. Um, and it is trying to use a range of methods, Kaura, to deliver solutions. So what works for, however, what works for one group of tamariki might not necessarily work for another. Yeah, well, like Anton, um, I don't have a problem talking about vulnerable children. I don't particularly like the name. I don't think it's um, child-centred. I don't think it represents Fano at all. Uh, but I, I wanted to make the point that our tamariki are not abused just in the now. They carry generations of state-imposed violence in their cellular memory, uh, layered like a, a cumulative trauma and what what we call historical trauma. Their mamai, their parents, their grandparents' experiences carried through the whakapapa and it hasn't been healed before the next incoming state-imposed violence hits. Um, that might be quite a strong statement, but I believe it to be true. This is why we've seen so many of our young people taking their lives. And um, but, so how does the ministry propose to address this kind of generational trauma when it doesn't even recognise it? We need to decolonise social work. In fact, all systems and return to Indigenous ways of healing. We still have this knowledge available to us. And... Uh, I believe we need to adhere to what some of our leaders are, are, are leading on, such mm. as uh, Rose Petty and her um, framework. Kilda. Well, I think uh, we'll go on to um, indigeneity in just a moment, but Liz, in, in respect to the strategy and the, the, um, the strategy around the new ministry, do you think that it was one that was designed with and by children? I, I think that... Uh children, um, especially children in care, in statutory care, have had um, some say, I know that there were some workshops that included um, uh, young people uh, who are in the uh, in the services in the um, um, under, under child, youth and family. Um, and I think that's reflected in one of the initiatives that have come out of the um, EAP report, and that is that the voices of um, children in care are heard. And I know that at this time there is an, um, a new agency being, an uh, advocacy agency being um, yeah. established to um, ensure that the, the that children in care have got access to an independent body um, and a team of of advocates who can actually uh, broker the relationships that they might have either with caregivers, with whānau or whoever. And I know that um, Minister Polly has been quite passionate about ensuring that the children's voices are heard. I'm not sure if that's generally across the whole of the new entity, but it's certainly the, the children who are in um, statutory care um, will have this independent body that they've never had before, but they've been asking for it for years. Well, Anton, how do you think this new ministry can ensure that uh, children-centric models are developed? Well, I think there's been, certainly with the Commissioner for Children's report on children in care and with the ministry and the, with the minister's response, I think there's clearly a commitment to focus on the needs of children in care. And while I think that's really important and obviously central to um, any strategy that involves child, youth and family, I really think it's picking at the low-hanging fruit. And while the, while the government has shown a lot of leadership um, in terms of addressing the needs of vulnerable children, I think that they're starting at the wrong end. So we're still looking at the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And what we need to be looking at is more support for families, particularly Māori families, when it comes to parenting 
um, and then looking more broadly at other issues like um, education and employment. I think to another restructuring of child, youth and family and tinkering with that machinery, I don't think we're going to see huge improvement in terms of the profile of vulnerable children. I think the solutions need to be uh, much more systemic and start much further back. Well, that raises a few issues that, uh, for the Māori Women's Welfare League crew because a lot of the things that, um, a lot of the issues that Anton has raised is are things that Women's Welfare League have done and are continuing to do now. So, and he, um, I think what I heard Anton say is that this is this new ministry is just a tinkering around of the edges. Uh, is what is the Women's Welfare League's thought on um, how different? and how new and innovative this service is going to be? Well, I don't, um, I don't know that it's going to be that new and innovative. I think probably um, one of the disappointing aspects of what's happening with the structure of this new entity has been the fact that there doesn't seem to have been a lot of discussion outside of those who are within existing departments people who are around the kind of policy uh, decision-making uh, pl places now within government that are actually putting together kind of framework. So I, th I think it's been disappointing that there hasn't been a lot of um, kōrero with the community or community groups that are working in the area. I agree entirely with Anton about the issue of the ambulance uh, at the bottom of the cliff because we're talking about interventions and involvement at a crisis level and we really have to get back to some basics and and it's been the position of the league we haven't achieved it in terms of the discussions with our government departments as yet but we actually have to start looking at working with the whanau much earlier um, when you know when they're coming when they're having their babies uh, right at the beginning, so we've got the supports around them. We're still dealing with a responsive role down the track when there's been a crisis. And, you know, if we're actually ever going to make any change, we have to have interventions that are about people um, knowing more about themselves, about trying to undo some of the uh, some of the damage that's been done, as Paula says, over generations, and trying to get the supports around, recognise the need to have them and to work with them to help the families to get through and to keep the kids in their care. And that's only going to happen at a really early stage. Well, I think that that's what um, the Ngāpuhi Runanga are trying to do, aren't you, Liz? You've, you have a memorandum of understanding with SIFS and you've had one since 2012. So how is that going? Um, it's slower than I'd like to see. We developed a plan with uh, Child, Youth and Families some years ago, probably in about 2013, um, and we're still kind of trying to get make our way through it. And a lot of that has been around the availability or lack of um, of the resources to actually move more quickly than, than we've been able to. We've made some inroads, we've made some progress, but um, it's, it's not as, as fast as I'd like to see. Uh, some of the aspects that Prue has, some of the aspects that Prue raised were around connectedness and relationship building, which is what Napuhi are trying to do with uh, your kids in care. Are you not? I mean, that's one of the that's one of the advantages that you have. That's true. The the board that I work to, the Napuhi Iwi Social Services, is a, is a subsidiary of the Runanga, and it's the Napuhi Runanga that has the. Um, MOU with um, with child youth and families, so we're the next level down, I guess, the operational arm of the Runanga. Um, and the, my board has uh, been saying for at least a couple of years that um, what they'd like to see, because we're very concerned by the number of uh, Ngāpuhi children who are in care. Um, at, the, at the end of last year, in December last year, there were more than 800 Ngāpuhi children uh, who fuck up a uh, who she, uh, they're not only Ngāpuhi, but they certainly have Ngāpuhi in their whakapapa. And that's a huge number of uh, Māori children in care, all from, you know, affiliated to, to our tribe. And so the board has asked that um, that we work, our organisation, the one that I lead, uh, works towards ensuring that no Ngāpuhi child leaves care without knowing who they are and where they belong. 
And so we've been working on a developing and manualising a program, a series of wānanga, um, and we've been building relationships. And it's been the MOU has been very useful, in fact, um, in building relationships with the Auckland Child, Youth and Family sites. And we've targeted sites in, in Manuka in particular because that's where the highest number of Ngāpuhi kids are. Mm. And, um, and the program that we're developing is intended to bring Ngāpuhi kids home from Auckland in all of the school holidays. And, you know, and the outcome we want for them after, after the three one that we've got um, uh, planned is that they, they do know who they are. They know their marae. They've met people that they're related to from around their marae. They've maybe swum in their own awa. They've climbed their own maunga. And they will leave here knowing um, where they come from, where their marae is, and that they will always belong there and that they can always come back. That's kind of what we're working to. But it's a big ask, just an open a lot of more than 200 uh, Ngāpuhi kids in Kia and up in Taipuk at a similar number. So we're not going further south than Auckland at this stage because um, we would be starting, but, uh, starting down the trail. But uh, we've been testing um, approaches and testing programs since November last year, October last year, and refining it, and we hope that it's going to be ready to roll, roll out early uh, in the new year. Well, Paola, if I can bring you in um, here, because Liz is talking about indigeneity. I mean, she's talking about whakapapa and um, connectedness, which is what you had raised earlier. So all indigenous people around the world, though, who have been colonised, show the same sorts of social problems. And the government fixes are based on the same colonial model. And uh, Ngāpuhi is going back to its original roots and its original tikanga and kaua. Is this new ministry going to, do you think, allow more of that type of indigeneity to roll out in its programme? Do you have confidence that it will? No, not confidence at all. But, um, you know, we, we, can, we can take leadership from uh, what's happening in the USA, Canada, Australia, and here, you know, um, we seem to be hell-bent hell on genocidal um, policies and mass incarcerating our people. And we, we've been doing that for, for generations now, and that includes our babies. Um, but now more than ever, we've got Indigenous people all over the world um, heading brilliant research in universities and in these countries that I've mentioned. Um, we've got ordinary people on the ground uh, fighting back reclaiming their land, their knowledge, their old ways of healing. And their young people are at the forefront of doing that. And it is about connection and re reconnecting with Papa Tuanuku and, and, and the natural ways of being. Canada's made some big strides uh, in the last few years with women such as Cindy Blackstock leading the way. And elsewhere we've got Angela Davis and... Um, even here we've got some really brilliant leaders who are all saying the same thing, that we do need to go back to um, the drawing board and we do need to, to use connections and Māori ways of healing. Like I said before, we've got that knowledge still available to us. There, there are clear solutions being advocated both here and, at, um, and overseas. We must provide Māori interventions and pathways towards what I call coming home to ourselves. It's imperative for Māori. We must be able to do this. It's the right thing to do, and we do it for the generations to come. Mm. Kia ora. Uh, Anton, according to Professor Leone Pihama, uh, colonisation impacts on our children through the m removal of every part of our cultural framework, and that, that enables our children to be um, safe. So... Um, when we are looking at methodologies similar to the one that Ngāpuhi is trying to go back to, to the collective hapu iwi model of uh, relationship strengthening, mm -hmm. surely that must be a central focus in terms of how the delivery of programming should, the, the new ministry should be thinking about these things? Well, uh, uh, number one, I think they need to have Māori strategy. 60% of their clients are Māori, so they need to put some energy into um, into exploring ways that those issues can be addressed with Māori families. Um, 
But, and I think that um, indigenous models are really important and there's certainly bucket loads of research in New Zealand that proves um, how successful Bai Māori, Whō Māori approaches are, but I don't think that they're the only solutions and I think that um, the, the Māori population is becoming much more diverse, so only 30% of us have tikanga and te reo Māori, so um, I don't think there's one size fits all. I think we need to be looking at many approaches and certainly um, recently I mean, we've looked at racism and how it impacts on African American children and Māori children in education and there is learning there. We can learn from other groups as well as indigenous groups. Mm. Uh, um, can I just uh, go to you now, Prue? Do you agree though, um, and I just want to pick up on a point that um, Anton made but just a little bit later, um, Professor P. Hummer says that until we deal with colonisation, neoliberalism and the impacts of individualisation and deal with the impacts of oppression, oppressive gender ideas, nothing's going to change. Now that's, that's a really hard long slog, eh? But do you think that it's necessary for us in order to achieve positive results for our kids? Oh, a absolutely. I mean, I think that we uh, have to look at why are we so different in terms of representation in these statistics, the statistics that are uh, reflective of administrations that are from a one culture, monocultural um, administration. So we have to accept that. We go through, we play around with uh, bicultural strategies. We talk about different frameworks. We bring people in to do bits and pieces. Um, that, for me, is tinkering around the edges. We actually have to have to get to a point where we actually do talk about colonisation because I think that that's the the biggest issue that we have are those that are making the decisions have to acknowledge that there's a process that's been gone through that gets us to the point we are today. And you have to acknowledge that to be able to move on and try to deal with it. So for sure, we have to, we have to address it. We have to look at more uh, strategies that don't reflect the dominant culture, strategies that are ours, strategies that uh, deal with the fact that we have had significant loss to get to the point we are today. We have our kids in care. As the steps of them being in care go on, it gets worse. So the state hasn't addressed it. We haven't had structures that have uh, been successful. Uh, there is no reason why we can't look at something that's, that's new, that's uh, reflecting us, our culture, our kids, uh, it, and it's not so much just about the rio and the tikanga. It's about actually getting to the point of acknowledging those issues. We are individualistic now. We weren't, and I mean it's the same issue when we talk about women. We had different attitudes about women prior to colonisation. So all of those issues have to be addressed when we look at how we deal with our kids. We have, to, we have to own some of that within this country before we can actually move on and make the changes that are going to be necessary to see any kind of positive response in the long term. I mean, it is a long, hard slog, but we've got to start somewhere. Right. Thank you very much um, to the panellists. We're just coming down to um, almost to the end. And uh, Elizabeth, if I can just ask you, I'll ask all of the panellists here, what would your dreams and aspirations be, or your hopes be, for this new ministry? Liz, what do you hope that this new ministry, whatever name we give it, um, what do you hope it will achieve? I'd like to see the new um, entity be more prepared to share the... Um to, to share responsibility for, especially for Māori kids and, uh, um, uh, who are in within the system. You know, I'd like to see, um, for instance, I, I believe that, that child youth and family for years have been trying to make their staff more culturally competent. And I would, I would probably propose that, look, 
a lot of the stuff that you try to do internally is never going to get done because, you know, people, that, for the same reasons that have been articulated, you know, if you don't understand the impacts of colonisation, you can't make a difference with families that you're trying to work with. I'm pushing to see that those, those services could be passed over to iwi and Māori providers so that we can provide a by Māori, for Māori service. I'd like to see us get more involved and right at the point of notification go in and look. And we're doing that. Some of the, the contracts that we have allow us to go in at the point of notification and say, we know this whānau, just give them over to us and we'll sort it. Mm. We have contracts that allow us to pull whānau back from the brink of, um, of uplift, you know. And I'd like to see more of that. And uh, certainly up here in the north and places like Kaikohe, where we're based, the relationship with the local office, uh, which has a lot of Māori staff, um, you know, they understand that and that they they do pass over whānau for us to deal with, you know, and seem to have some trust that we could do it better than they could. And I'd like to see that more general in terms of um, practice in the new entity, that they acknowledge we're not the best ones to deal with whānau. We're mm. not the best ones to deal with Māori children. We've got networks out there. We've got iwi, we've got Māori providers and other services too that can do that better than we could. So I'd like to see them acknowledge that there are, there are better options than trying to do mm. all of that. Kia ora. Kia ora for that. And Paura, what, what would you hope will come out about um, with this new ministry? Uh, I'm so sorry, you're, you're fading and I didn't quite hear the question. What do you hope this new ministry that's going to uh, launch in April next year, what do you hope it, it will achieve for us? Look, that, that's such a big question, but uh, what I'd like to see is way more partnership with iwi Māori rather than just treating them as another uh, a service provider. I, I would like to see uh, more, cultural, more culturally competent training provided to our social workers. Uh, there's a lot of cultural incompetence and ignorance out, out there, a lot of fear around working with our, our whānau effectively. Um, I would like to see education and training providers uh, step up the mark and uh, find ways of helping our social workers be truly competent in, in the, and confident in working with our people. If they have to be out there, then do it. If you really want to see what true competence looks like, then have a look at what uh, Tuanango, Rokawa and Aotearoa are doing. And mm. as for Iwi working with their own, have a look at two mm. Kia ora. And Prue, do you think that we will see major changes and in a short space of time, or do you think it's just a bit of um, tinkering around the edges? Um, I'd, I'd hope we would see changes. But, I mean, I think the change has to be that this, uh, this whatever it's called, ministry has to be a facilitator. And, and not be uh, the body that we see as uplifting our kids and that parents see as taking their kids. Um, they actually have to facilitate some solutions for whānau. Um, and, and that's a really different approach, a completely different, uh, almost instead of a, a punitive approach to actually taking a resolution approach. And that means working with iwi Māori, that means working with uh, the community in terms of... But they have to get to a point of acknowledging that they don't always have the answers yes. and that they need others in the community to find those uh, solutions. Thank you. And Anton, very quickly. OK, one thing, they need to address worker bias. And we know police, justice, welfare is riddled with worker bias. Um, so uh, Māori are more likely to be arrested. Se almost 70% of children in youth justice facilities are Māori children in care and protection and youth justice facilities. That work is being done by Māori workers and non-Māori workers. It's really urgent that we begin to address worker bias so that they understand how bias plays out in their decision making mm. about Māori kids. Mm. Kia ora. Well, thank you very much to our panel for joining us this evening. And uh, don't forget to join us tomorrow night, 7pm. Martin Bradbury will be back with you. Wātea Fifth Estate. Noho mai. Kia ora. Wātea Fifth Estate. Brought to you by Voyager Internet. Call them on 0800 4Speed.